want to do today is after having discussed uh, briefly the, some of the population movements in the uh, 18th, 19th century, 17th, 18th, 19th, discussing the short-term migration after the Khmelnytsky uprising. And what I claimed there, and you were very polite and you did not argue with me, is that when people run away from danger, they run away until they are safe. And then they usually wait for the danger to pass. When the danger passes, then they go back to where they were. The same way if a bird sees a fox, the bird flies into the tree, and when the fox goes away, then the bird goes down to the ground. That's the usual way people behave when they feel there is a danger. And then I discuss the fact that there was constantly growing Jewish population, faster than the general population, and this continually created pressure when all of the opportunities within the region wherever Jews lived were filled, there were no more opportunities, then they looked for another place. A little bit like Kiev. One of the mysteries for me in Kiev is how are there so many places for coffee? And the coffee is good, but everywhere you go, there are two places for coffee. I cannot understand how so many places have enough customers to survive. And I suspect there might be too many. But if anybody has an answer, tell me afterwards uh, what, what the secret is. So that my, migration was the same thing. People looked for opportunities. When there were not enough opportunities, then they moved onward. And in the 19th century, the migration of Jews was largely to Ukraine. It's a very significant rise in the population of Ukraine or the areas near Ukraine uh, in Russia. And with the rise in population, um, other cultural activities <coughs> developed as well, so that if you were interested in cultural history, then the place where the action was, was in the Ukraine. Professor uh, Chernin, uh, can I ask for a copy also? <laughs> uh, the Bialik, all the other off, off important authors migrated to Odessa. So that was the cultural center. So the question then comes up, what happened? Now, if we discuss the rise of Ukraine as a economically in the 19th century, what was happening? There were factories, but what was the main engine of growth in Ukraine. The wheat trade. Massive growing of wheat. And what was the wheat net for? For export. What was necessary to enable the export of wheat? It had to go from the farm to Odessa. And in Odessa, there it went on ships, and the ships brought the wheat to Europe. This was a huge market, and it was one of the important factors, at least as far as I know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I think it was one of the most important factors for the economic growth of, um, of Ukraine. Who put the wheat on the boats in Odessa. Of course, the workers in the ports were largely Ukrainian, but who were the big traders of wheat? If we take the middle of the 19th century and later, who were the big traders? Greeks. Why Greeks? 
because they had a network of companies which had branches all over the Mediterranean. There were families or relatives, so that with working within the network, they would export wheat from Odessa, and their cousins or their friends or their colleagues would take the wheat and pass it and send it on to European ports where it was transferred. This was a very big industry, a big export market, and it was quite ethnic. There were exceptions. There were also other foreigners. There were French, there were Italians. Uh, Odessa, much more than Kiev, as far as I know, was a much more cosmopolitan city. It was, they had an exceptional Italian opera there. And the cosmopolitan nature of the city was influenced by all of the foreign uh, agents who would buy the wheat and send it off. Marketing is a very complicated business and if somebody wants to export, it is not enough to have a product to sell. It is important to know who will buy it and who can be trusted. So this was the big market for wheat. Now, as this market grew, as always happens, it encountered complications and difficulties. Who, which country was the growing competitor for Ukraine? Very far away. The United, which country was competition for Ukraine, or this was the Tsarist Empire. The country that was the competitor for Ukraine was the United States. This was the, uh, another center of growing grain. Today, what would be the third center? Australia. Big country, lots of land, lots of grain. But at this ad, in the 19th century, the comp competition was the United States. What was the problem for the export of grain from the United States? What, what was the problem that the Americans had? Distance. Distance. Because the grain had to go a long way. It had, if we take the port, the grain was going from New, mainly from New York or New Jersey, other ports on the Atlantic, and it had to cross the Atlantic, which is very big, to get to the markets in Europe. Now, this, this uh, export market, uh, this export at the beginning of the 19th century, 1820, 1830, 1840, was rather impossible. It was not really practical to export a lot of grain. Why? How did the boats cross the Atlantic? They had sails, and the wind pushed the boat. And if there was no wind, then the boat stood still. What were the boats built out of? They were built out of wood. So the boats were small. During the course of the war in the United States between the North and the South, one of the byproducts was the construction of more and more boats that were built out of metal, iron boats or steel. These boats had a big advantage. What was the advantage? They could be built to be much bigger. The material was stronger. And what developed? Machines and engines to push the boat with a propeller and not to need the wind. So this solved the problem for 
exporting wheat from the United States to Europe. And you are asking, Stafford is talking about Jewish migration. Why is he talking about boats? <laughs> there is a plan. You will hear it. So the boats were built bigger, and they could go from New York easily to Europe, quickly carrying a large amount of grain. Now, this only solved half of the problem. What was the other problem that existed for the development of grain export in the United States? You get from New York to Europe. Fine, very good. The problem is, how do you get to New York? Because if you go to New York, there are lots of build, big buildings, but there's no grain. There no niente. So what do you do? Where is the grain in America? It's more to the west. It's in the middle of America. For this, it was necessary to have what? Railroads. Railroads. And here God helped very much. Railroads were built. And a network of railroads began to be built in the United States, again, in the second half of the 19th century. And the railroads brought the grain from uh, Ohio, from Kansas, from Illinois, all of the places in the middle of America, it brought the grain to New York. How did the railroads bring the grain? In cars, big train cars. And it was very quick. And a system was developed in America for the storage of grain. Grain was stored, then the train came, the railroad, the grain was put on the railroad, brought to New York, and then sent on to Europe. This was a very efficient system. The more the system was efficient, the more problems there were for which city in the world? Odessa. Good news for New York was bad news for Odessa. This is a world of international competition. Now, in Odessa, people may not have thought so much about the world picture. <clears throat> they knew the price of grain went down. They didn't discuss the railroads in America, necessarily. But they did know the price was going down. And there was, a <coughs> there was a problem with the grain itself. How was much of the grain brought to Odessa? Not by train, but by, wag <coughs> by wagons. What is the problem with wagons? It's slow. Animals, mice, can get in the wagons sometime. The grain on the way can become bad grain. So that it was surprising, but the grain that came to America was to Europe often came in a better condition than the grain that came to Ode from Odessa, even though Odessa was closer. What was necessary to improve the situation? A government that understood how important it was to develop railroads and efficient transport. Unfortunately, the Tsars did not have this understanding in their heads. They had other problems. So that without a government which is concerned for transport, Efficient export and efficient economic growth is a very big problem. Now, 
of course you realize that I am very intelligent and I am very perceptive. But one of the first things I noticed when I came from the airport to Kiev was how good was the condition of the road. The road, this is not a joke. I looked at the road, there were no holes. And I said, <laughs> something is being done correctly. Because if somebody realizes the importance of transport, it's not just Shaul Stamfer in a taxi, but this means that there's an awareness of the importance of infrastructure. Now, when the trains brought the grain to New York, there was a problem. There are many problems. The trains were owned by capitalists. And people tell you that capitalists are not nice. I also say so. They're not nice people. But they're not always stupid. The train came to New York full of grain and it went back to the West empty. empty. This is not good. A good capitalist wants to make money this way and that way. Now here is where we have to consider the clothes that we wear. And look around here. I don't know very much about clothing, but I am 100% certain that everything that you are wearing came from a store. I don't think that anybody here made their clothes by themselves. <laughs> now, today, this, we are aware of this phenomenon. We do not realize what a revolution this is in marketing. Because we go to a store, and at the store do they not say, what is your name? What do they say? What is your size? Are you 5, 6, 11, 21? Because in the store you have clothing prepared already by the size. This is all something of the last 130 years. This did not exist before. Before, how did people get clothes? Of course, they went to a tailor and the clothing was made exactly to the size of the person. Now, this was a system that made sense. Why? If a tailor makes many clothes the same size, it's more efficient. He can cut 10 pieces of cloth at the same time, either with his hand or with a machine. He can sew quickly one after another the same size. But what is the problem if you sit in Kiev and you make 100 shirts? You may not have enough people in Kiev to purchase all of the shirts. And if you want to send the shirts to, uh, to another place where you want to sell the shirts as well, you know, Vinitsa. What is the key factor you have to examine? The price of transport. And if the price of transport is high, and that means if you are sending the shirts in a wagon, then it's expensive, you, uh, because a wagon cannot carry many shirts, then it is not efficient to market all over, from uh, Kiev to Vinitsa, because the cost of transport is too high. So you do not find anywhere prepared clothing that's made in different sizes before late in the 19th century. When you have inexpensive transport, then it makes sense to have factories where it is possible to lower the cost of clothing 
and to by doing and to do that, then to ship the cloak. Now here I know less, so you can tell me if I am right or wrong. But if I was in Israel, I would say that eighty, at least eighty percent of the clothing that people wear was made in China. There is very, very little clothing made in Israel. Very little. Just very fancy dresses for women. In America, which I can testify, I visit America every once in a while, almost nothing is made in America. <laughs> Everything is imported to China. Why? How can this be? For a simple reason, that what happened? Very cheap. Very cheap transport. The invention of containers was a revolution in transport. You fill a container and it goes on a ship in seconds. And I'm sure you've all seen the photographs. The huge ships can take a huge number of containers. So the cost of transport per shirt is very low and it's impossible to compete with China because not only is manpower inexpensive but since the export is so inexpensive that they're by making millions of shirts they lower the cost of production. Now here one can ask a question there is another huge country in Asia that has inexpensive manpower. India. That is India. Why is it that so much of the clothing comes from China and Vietnam and relatively little comes from India? Anybody who has been to India, I have never been, but people told me stories, tells me that there is a huge difference between India and China. What's, there are many differences. In China they speak Chinese, in India they speak a hundred languages, but for in our context, what is the main difference? Transport. Going in India by train is not, is interesting, but it's not efficient, and many places the roads are in very poor condition. In China, the roads are good, the railroads are good, which means that the export is efficient. Transport is a key. Good transportation opens many, many opportunities and bad transportation the reverse. So that we have in America the development of a transport system that was very efficient, that brought the grain to New York and then to Europe, and then created the conditions for large factories in New York which would produce clothing or other, whatever product that you wish, and then it was easy to market it in all of the United States. And that is the way that the clothing industry developed in the United States. And in this way, the owners of the railroads were happy because the railroads were full in both directions. The people who bought the clothes were happy because the cost of clothes went down. Who was not happy? The tailors in all of the cities. But not everybody can be happy. It's a problem. Uh, so, then that, is, that happened in the United States. The more it developed in the United States, the greater the pressure on Ukraine and the lower the profits for the Greek traders who were in Odessa. Therefore, it is not a surprise that for this reason and other reasons as well, what happened to the, what did the Greek traders in Odessa do? They moved elsewhere. They were mobile. 
they were part of a network, so they could go to Alexandria, which was developing at the same time with the Suez Canal, other places as well. Who took the place of the Greeks in the export market? Now it is the Jews, who were, had, no, had fewer options. They were not as, it was not easy for them to travel in the Mediterranean. They did not have a network to support them. So as a result, they began to develop, deal with the export market in uh, Odessa, even though the profits were much lower and it was much more risky. Now, I will continue with this development a little bit and then we will go on to, uh, to this page, which, uh, which is the first page from the article of Spitzer. Now, what happens when profits are smaller and the market is not as stable? This means that sometimes there is a lot of work when the market has a good year, and then what, happen and then what happens when there is a bad year? There are many people who do not have work. And people who do not have work are hungry, they have families to support. It is not a happy period. So that now this is the, will be some of the background for Spitzer. Uh, Spitzer himself is an economist who is an expert, a real expert on not on dealing with statistics. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He's very, very gifted. Uh, but this is the background to it, which is, did not interest him as much. In the early 1880s, there was very bad years in the export market in Odessa. Bad years for export means that there are good conditions for violence. And indeed, there were a, num a series of pogroms in, uh, in the uh, Ukrainian lands, 1881-1882, after the assassination of Alexander. The violence what may have been triggered by politics, but it, it spread because of the large populations who were very tense because of the poor economic conditions. Now, what is interesting is that in the from that year on and, uh, and for many more years after, there was large-scale migration of Jews from the Pale of Settlement to New York. Uh, huge numbers. Now, if we consider this migration, it is a bit of a surprise because it came relatively quickly. It started, it developed, and it was large numbers that had a big impact. And one of the interesting things is that the, even though people said that they that the migrants left because of the pogroms, as it turned out, they did not really come from Ukraine. The Jews of Ukraine said, it's a bad year for everybody. Wait a little bit, next year it'll be quieter, and it was. The migration of Jews came mainly from Poland and Lithuania. And now, before we discuss the politics, which I will not discuss anyway, or before we go to Spitzer, we can begin to ask some simple questions. How does one get from Poland to America in 1890? From Poland to America. From London. From London. Well, not, you have to get to London, though. So. You have to go, it's mainly from Germany, the migration. Now, how do people get from Germany to America? 
on a boat. Now, what is the price of a ticket on a boat? Is it expensive or is it not expensive? Relatively. It should be expensive, but if it's expensive, then people will not go. Because the people who went were poor. If you're rich, stay where you are. Unless the government is looking for you. But most people who migrate are poor. They fly Ryanair and not Swiss Air. <laughs> That means something to you. Or what, what does Ryanair fly to Kiev? Or Wizz Air? Or Wizz, Air. Wizz Air. All right. When you're a student, you fly Wizz Air. You don't fly uh, Swiss, even though the food on Swiss Air is better. <laughs> so that the expensive tickets are not practical for hundreds of thousands of migrants. So, the, t the ticket has to be inexpensive. But how could it be inexpensive? It's a long trip. The answer is that the people who owned boats were also capitalists. What was the problem of the boat owners? The boats are going between Hamburg and America. What are the boats doing? From America to Hamburg, they are bringing grain. They're bringing grain. They're destroying the Odessa export market. They're bringing, bringing grain to Europe. What is the problem for the boat owners? If they go back to America, they're going to go back empty. They're not making money. They want to make a lot of money. So what do they do? When they go back to America, what do they put on the boat? People. And then they make money both ways. Now this is very important, and this is something that Spitzer doesn't discuss so much, that migration is, law, distance migration is helped or influenced a great deal by the price of transportation. The less the cost of a ticket, the more people will be able to travel. So if we ask now a simple question, this is my examination question, there's no examination, don't worry. Why wasn't there large-scale migration from Poland to America in 1850? One part of the answer is that in 1850, to cross the ocean cost a great deal of money. So that you can have migration, but it's more expensive. The more the cost goes down, the more people will migrate. But that is not all of the story. The Jews who came to America, what was the key element they needed before they decided to go to America? Information. information. And we'll come back to this a few times. What information in particular did these Jews need to know? Conditions. What, which conditions? Accommodation. Job. Accommodation. Economical. You can sleep Economical. on the street. Job. The most important People. is jobs, economic. What is the possibility of finding a place to work? So that if a person knows that they will find a place to work, or they're confident, then they'll take the risk of traveling. If they are certain that they will not find a place to be employed, it then if they are poor, they will certainly not waste money on a ticket to cross the ocean and then to come back two days later. It's like going to America without a visa. It's not worthwhile because they're terribly disgusting. 
The only thing I can tell you is that there is no discrimination in America. They're disgusting also to American citizens. That's the first condition for working at the border in America is to be not nice. In the Ukraine, it's different today. But when I came here in Soviet times, it was, it was different. Now it's much better. America is the same. So that you have to know, can you get a job in America? Now, what did the Jews do when they came to America? Most of the Jews, what did they do? They worked with other Jews in which business? Trade. No, not trade. Because they are all speaking so Yiddish. Is. If you're speaking Yiddish, how can you do trade? Nobody understands you, and you don't understand. You say a hundred, they think you say ten. You can't do business. That's why, if you look at migration today, which people migrate more? Doctors or lawyers? Doctors. Why? They don't need to talk. They just cut you open, <laughs> inside, it's the same. A lawyer has to talk. It's the same thing. Who migrates more to America? Teachers of Ukrainian or people who teach computers? Computers. It's, uh, computers is an international language. So that the migrants who came to America could not do trade at the beginning. Afterwards they could. But most of them, what did they do? They went to work in making clothes. They were tailors. And where did they work? In New York, in the new factories. Now this is very important. Let us say you have a population of uh, living in a certain place who provides certain uh, services. Let's say taxi drivers. That's good. And then you have here in Kiev competition between the taxi and between Uber. That's fine. If we could imagine a situation in which suddenly there was large-scale migration of taxi drivers from Belarus to Ukraine, and they started driving taxis, and they would say, we will take even less money than Uber. It will be Bielo Uber. <laughs> now, what would happen very quickly? With that, you do not have to be a genius to figure out what would happen. Price becomes lower. You are an optimist. I am a realist. <laughs> what? Uh, uh, people who are driving here will be without job. And if peop and if they're without jobs, and if they're uh, hungry, uh, and if they have to feed their children, operation. they will start making demonstrations. <laughs> and what will they say? The only people who should drive a taxi should be citizens of Ukraine. We should not allow people from another place to come and to take away our jobs. And this would be quite understandable. This is natural. Immigrants usually do what occupations? They do what local people cannot do or do not want to do. Either occupations which are unpleasant or occupations that there's some kind of a special skill. But successful migration fills a hole. Migration that leads to competition very quickly leads to unpleasant results. Now, if the Jews who came to America were able to work hundreds of thousands making clothes, this was because of one reason, that the factories for clothing in New York, were they, did they have many workers already many years? No. 
Why? Because the factories were new. new. Why were they new? Because the factories could be built only when there were railroads. The factories could, uh, you can only have a factory when the price of transport declined. So the Jews who came were very lucky that it was just the right time to come to America. There was a new industry, and in the new industry there were no veteran Americans who would lose their jobs because the Jews took a lower salary, and therefore the Jews were able to take advantage of this opportunity. Did the Jews think about this? No. All they knew is that my cousin was in New York and he said there are jobs. Come. <laughs> but if we look at the big picture, the construction of the railroads made the construction of factories possible, which made the absorption of Jews possible, and at the same time, this was because of the railroads and the railroads and the large boats that went to Europe, at which lowered the cost of transport, <coughs> which allowed the Jews to come to New York. Everything is linked together. And it's easier, of course, to see this after the fact than during the fact. And the same railroads which created jobs in New York for Jews and Italians and other people as well, the same railroads also caused what phenomenon? The decline of the grain market in Odessa and the pogroms that took place in the 1880s. Everything which happened has a connection. Now, what I want to do with you is to, uh, to look at this uh, page, which is an abstract of Spitzer, and then I want to add what, uh, a number of facts, which I think are the most important facts from the article of Kuznets. The article of Kuznets is too long. But he was a professor at Harvard University, so he could do whatever he wanted. And does anybody here I don't know, study economics? A little bit? All right, I'll still ask for your help. There's a phrase in economics which is called the gross national product. Yeah. The total. Yeah. You know who invented that, I, that word? Kuznets. Yeah. So he was a big economist. Nobody could tell Kuznets, make your article shorter. <laughs> because uh, he was famous Kuznets. I think he got a Nobel Prize. So it's too long. So, but I'll try to take some of the important points from him. So the migration of one and a half million Jews from the Russian Empire to the United States is commonly linked to the occurrence of pogroms. This is the way many people write an article. I do this also. You write, everybody says that this is the reason, and then you know that he will say something different. But the truth is, not even before Spitzer wrote, not everybody said this. But it gives a little drama to the article. Although the common perception that pogroms were a major cause is now questioned, little quantitative evidence exists to support or refute this view. I construct a new data set that matches hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants to their hometowns. What he did was he used computer programs to take lists of all of the Jewish immigrants and then to calculate on the basis of these lists where they came from and what year they came. This is a very, very sophisticated computer program and much of the 
new work in history is based on uh, using methods to deal with great, great quantities of data. So, I don't know how, who is, is planning to do what. I don't know what the job market is in history, but the use of computers is one of the, uh, uh, one of the hot uh, items. Now, I want to skip about the 12th line down, at the end of the, near the end of the line, I find no evidence. He's, so he writes, I find no evidence that migration in its earliest stages was caused by the 1881-1882 pogroms. All right. He, and he's correct. No question that he's correct. Now we can ask, ask ourselves, what would we anticipate, or on the basis of what we know, what would have been likely that would be the result of pogroms in 1881? How could the Jews or should the Jews have behaved? On the basis of what we know, that means on the basis of what I taught, it's when you have violence, and migration, what is the nature of the migration? The migration is short distance. People, so that if you have a bomb in uh, some terror act in a city, so normal people might think, maybe I should go away to my grandfather for a few weeks. However, if there is a bomb in the city, what do normal people not do? Move to a different country. I mean, that is exaggerated. You don't go to a different country because one bad event happened. Maximum, you go out of the city a little bit. So that, as over and over, you, I, I, we find that when there's an act of violence, people may run away for a little while, but why do they come back? Why do they come back? Because over. Right. They have a house, they have a job, they have friends, if you run away to another country, what do you have? Nothing. Nothing. And not only that, when you have to run away quickly, what do you usually not have? Information. You don't have time to check and examine what is the situation. You do have information about places that are close, so that if there, there is a huge flood and you leave Kiev because of the flood, so you'll go to a place that's higher and not a place that's lower. Right? That's a reasonable thing to do. But you, people will do not go to different countries. So that, when he says, I find no evidence that migration in its earliest stages was caused by the pogroms, we all now say, that makes sense, because we know, in general, pogroms, violence, terror acts, leads to short distance migration, usually. So, instead, migration after these pogroms continued along a pre-existing spatial trend of migration. These are big words, even for an English reader. What he's saying is, that the migration which had already taken place, which was not from Ukraine, but was from Western Poland, near the border with Germany, this migration continued. He said the second wave of migrations, this was directly caused by the Tsarist policies, did have a, uh, a rise in migration by 10 or 20%. But what he does not add, it was also very short term. Now, uh, 
Now, what is, what is he, how does he interpret this? I interpret these findings as an indication that neither pogroms nor economic or demographic conditions determine the timing of the beginning. Instead, migration was chiefly ignited, that's like a fire, to light a fire by chain migration networks. Now, here there are two things that are important. He says that what is significant is not economic or demographic conditions, but chain migration. What is chain migration? I'll tell you. A chain is like... And that's where one person goes to another country. Very often this is a person who seeks out adventure, a person who takes risks, who is not very responsible, but he goes somewhere and he succeeds. And then he writes to his brother and cousin, then they go and then they tell their neighbors and they tell their brothers and sisters. If you recall, and of course you recall every word I said, another way of describing chain migration is snowball that more and more people hear about it. What's important when you say chain is that there's always a connection between a person who goes and a person who has already gone to the place. It's not the way we read an advertisement about a vacation in scenic Bangladesh and then we, or Myanmar, and then we get on a plane and find ourselves in the middle of a war zone. Mm -hmm. So that this is based on not reading, but on direct information. And therefore, it's a chain step by step. Secondly, uh, what is important is the emphasis of uh, Spitzer. What is he describing? And here the words are important. The, I'll be, read again from the beginning. I interpret these findings as an indication that neither pogroms nor economic or demographic conditions determined the timing of the beginning. Instead, it was chain migration. What? was not determined by economic conditions. Here the key word is timing, the time. When did it begin? What Spitzer does not discuss here, and it's very important for us, is that a chain can go in any direction. A chain can go to the north, to the south, to the east, and much of the migration that was to the United States, he found over the course of time, came from which regions? Poland and Lithuania and Belarus. That was the main source of population for migration. What was excluded from the population masses? Which region? Ukraine. Why was there relatively little migration from Ukraine? Because it was good in Ukraine. People wanted to stay here. People saw potential for the future. The people in Lithuania, how did Jews regard the future? Very pessimistically. Why? There was overpopulation of Jews, and they did not think it would become better. And what was missing in Lithuania and in Poland? What was, what was missing? Industrialization, 
and economic development. There, there, there was not a sense that the, economy, that the economy was going to grow and to develop positively in the coming years. Why was it difficult in uh, Lithuania to industrialize? It was easier to not to not to build a factory. What was easier to purchase in the West? Imports were in easier. It's very very difficult to compete with the Western export markets. So that. Somebody today, for example, could open a factory in Ukraine to make shirts, but it would be a questionable investment. Why? The question is, can, is it possible to compete with China? And you have to calculate, do the advantages of transport and maybe other factors, quality, outweigh the potential of China to lower costs and to compete very severely. So that the Jews in Lithuania and, in, and Belarus did not see much of an economic potential and therefore they were very pessimistic about what the future would be. So that we have here a uh, a pattern of migration, the Spitzer marks the beginning. The beginning was linked to chains and not to economic conditions, but the growth of migration was very closely linked to eco economy. Where people did not see a future, that's where they began, uh, that's where they began to leave. And uh, this, this focus has to be balanced. Now, here, it is con worthwhile considering some of the characteristics of the migration of Jews from uh, Eastern Europe in general, largely from, uh, largely from uh, Lithuania, Belarus, parts of Poland, Bialystok, to very much to the United States. What are the characteristics of this migration? Kuznets, who was a very intelligent man, went over the census data carefully and he noted an important factor that generally migration is gender linked. There are, we've, and this is Rabenstein already said it, notice this, remember the first, my first lecture? long ago, three days ago, that short-term migration, short-distance migration generally is women, long-distance migration is generally men. Most of the migration to the United States was more men than women. There were two groups that were rather exceptional. Of course the Jews were exceptional, because they're always exceptional. <laughs> and there was another group, the Norwegians. The Norwegians and the Jews shared a common characteristic, in that there were more or less the same number of women as men who migrated. Pretty close. There were more older people among the Jews than among the Norwegians, but the gender breakdown, male, female, was quite similar. Now, if you knew, if you were familiar with American ethnic uh, characteristics, the Norwegians and the Jews have very little to do with each other. They're very different. The Norwegians did not come to New York. The Norwegians went to the middle of America, to the farming land, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin. These are place areas in the middle of America, and they settled down and uh, they built very, very successful farming communities. 
Now, here, with a little bit of imagination, we can reconstruct the dynamic. This was relatively unique for migrants to America. Why did the Norwegians come, men and women, and have this settlement pattern? Why did they, first off, why did they leave Norway? Norway is a very nice country. Beautiful fjords, lots of oil. Why go away from Norway? The answer is, A, the fjords were beautiful then, like now, but in the winter it's very, very cold, and oil was in the future. But why did they leave Norway? Or not so... Infrastructure, maybe not... Not, 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 not many jobs. There weren't very many jobs. Economics was the problem. Economics is always the key. That's the most important thing. People say that rich people aren't happy, but they're happier than other people. Having money is nice. But what were these people who settled in Wisconsin before they came to Wisconsin? What were they doing? We can guess. Nobody who is a farmer can say that my father lived where? In a city. People almost never go from cities to farms, except in exceptional conditions. After the Roman Empire collapsed, people went to farms. But generally, mo movement is from farm to city. So if the Norwegians were farmers in America, we already know what were they doing before that in Norway? They were also farmers. What is the problem of Norway? There is a great deal of snow. There is a great deal of water. What is deficitni? What is shortage? Good land. There's very little good land for farming. And that's why we don't read very much about Norwegian apples or Norwegian pineapples, <laughs> you don't grow very much. If the health becomes better and fewer children die, then in Europe, life expectancy went up. In Sweden, there was a shortage of land, or as it's called in the literature, land hunger. It's a hunger for land. And the Swedes came to America, what were they looking for? Land. land. And what did they find in America? Land. <laughs> and if you ask the, the Nor not the Swede, the Norwegian, if you ask the Norwegian who came to America on the boat, what are you looking for? He was saying, I'm looking for a place where I can be a farmer, where there is land. And then if we ask him, what are your long-term plans? What was the answer? I'm going to stay. Because if he goes back to Norway, what is impossible to take with him? The land. You can get on a boat, but you cannot take the land with you. He knew when he said goodbye to his parents, what did he know? He would never see, he would never see them again. It's not so easy to do but they had no choice. When somebody comes to America with plans to stay in America forever, what then is a good idea to bring along? A family. A family, a wife. It's much easier. A wife from Norway who will understand. And of course, I'm being sexist because I'm seeing the male as the main agent. But you can look at it also as the female Females who found no hope in Norway would find it more intelligent to go to America with a boyfriend than to go by themselves because if they went by themselves, where would they fit in in America? With a boyfriend, together they could obtain land and start a farm. So that when a person knows that the move that he is making is permanent, then they go together as families. There were many other migrants to America at the same time. 
Irish and Italians, for example. However, in these population groups, there was less balance. There were many women that came, but not 50-50 like the Jews and the Norwegians. Not 50-50, 48, 52. Why? Why was that? What were the Italians and the Irish thinking? They were already thinking very intelligently. What? Right now in Italy, or this is again the men. In Italy or Ireland, I have no money. I'm hungry, I have no money, I have no future. What will I do? I'll go to America, make money, I'll sleep on the floor, I'll eat bread, I will save every penny, and then when I have money, then I will go home, I will buy a nice house, I will have land, to be a farmer or have a job, and then I will be very happy. This was the typical plan for many of the Italian and the Irish. Uh, people make plans, the results are not always according to the plans, but we do see the disbalance. Most of the Irish and Italians stayed in America. Some of them brought over later girlfriends or relatives to join them, but on the whole, they came to remain. Now, the Jews who came, came like Norwegians, but they went to places like whom? Like the Irish and the Italians. So you have here a paradox. You behave, you, you travel like a short-term worker, but you behave, bringing a family, like a farmer. Here, we can add something about the pogroms. Even if the economic perspective in Lithuania was not good, a person could say, well, I'll work in America for 10 years or five years, and then I'll go back to Vilnius and I'll open an American restaurant or I'll open an American shoe store. But the Jews didn't do that. Why were, in addition to pessimism about economy, why were they hesitant to come back? What did they take seriously? Not only the economic conditions, but the anti-Semitism. Were, there were no very few pogroms where they lived, but they said to themselves, this is a bad sign for the future, and that they came, that in America there would, it would be safe and there would no, be no violence against Jews. So here we see that very possibly stereotypical images about anti-Semitism can affect the decision. A person decides to leave for economic reasons. However, once deciding to leave, determining the policy and how he leaves, this can be determined by other factors as well as including anti-Semitism. When the Jews came to America, what did they say when they got off the boat? What am I looking for? Freedom, justice, democracy, a new world. What did they really want? A job. But it's nicer to say that you come for freedom than to say that you come because you need to feed your children. But they meant it. They were honest. Because when they thought about their old homes, they thought about the pogroms, and the violence which they saw as the future of the Tsarist regime. And living under, living under the Tsarist regime, the prognosis was not very positive. Even though at the same time, the Jews in Ukraine, who were the closest to the pogroms, realized correctly that this was not something inherent in their society, but it was a passing phenomenon 
that was caused by extreme conditions. So we have the odd situation of massive migration from regions that were not pogrom regions, but influenced by the atmosphere, and low migration from the Ukrainian lands. Many years ago, uh, I dealt with the same problem Spitzer dealt with, and I noticed an interesting thing in America. In America, most of the old-time Jews, the Jews that came 100 years ago, are not Hasidim. And in Ukraine, most of the Jews were Hasidim. So I already said then, the Jews didn't come from Ukraine, they came from another region entirely. What Spitzer did, and it's beautiful, is he found the evidence that proves that this is indeed the case. So I can feel that I'm very smart. I thought about this, but Spitzer did a superb job of really analyzing the phenomena, analyzing the timing, which I had never thought about, the importance of chain migration, although we have to add economy. So, why did the Jews come to America? Because the railroad was built from New York to Chicago that caused the grain trade in Odessa to go down, which caused the pogroms, which enabled the poor people from Lithuania who looked for a better life to go to America. What does this tell us? We all live in a big world. We all influence each other. Nobody can be by himself. And it's best to live well with each other. That's a good recipe. That's it. Thank you very much for your money. And uh, I wish you all great success. You know, all the nice things should happen to you. It has been very pleasant.